Hi, um, my name is Trey Metter. I am a uh, living historian from the Texas Military Forces Museum at Camp Mabry. Uh, I grew up, in, I was born in Dallas, uh, Texas. I grew up in South Mississippi. Um, I joined the Army after college. I got a degree in history, minors in Spanish and English. And then I uh, joined the Army because I was tired of being a poor college student. So I went to uh, see the world, I guess. I don't know. And it's something I always wanted to do. And um, so I was a DC mark for the recruiter. I walked in, I said, I want to join, and these are the things I want to do. And I took tests, and he says, great, this is the kind of guy we're looking for. Um, you can do anything you want. And I said, OK, something in intelligence. OK, well, he didn't know a lot about uh, intelligence jobs, so we just signed up for the first thing that was there, and it was to become a Russian linguist. Um, um, I've worked different things, but I've always had a love and interest in history. And so um, getting on with the guys at the museum enables me to do stuff like this. My uniform. My uniform is an actual uniform that was, the tags say it was made in 1969, so this uniform is older than me. My boots were made in 1967, so they're actually older than me as well. I've got green smocks on, made out of wool. Um, those are new. Uh, this is a reproduction watch. It's made in China, I think. Um, I've got a couple of um, reproduction uniforms here that are made in you know, various places. And then everything else, we're going to handle, show whatever else is actual equipment uh, from the Vietnam era. Some of it may have actually been in Vietnam and brought back. Others may have just been in the inventory at the time. Food, water, shelter? Right, okay, food, water, shelter. So, when you're outside at any time, you need stuff for basic life support, food, water, shelter. The first thing, food, I like food, as it shows. Uh, this is what's called a sea ration. Um, it predates what we know now as MREs. It's a fully canned meal. This is all one unit. Uh, it's called meal, combat individual. Uh, beef slices and potatoes with gravy, unit B2. So uh, they were not very popular with the troops. Um, and as a result, uh, they would have, whether they were in an operate, a board operating base, away from uh, the base camp and, and the rear areas of, a, of a, um, where they were deployed, um, out in the woods, out in the boonies, they would have a helicopter come every day to bring them more of these, bring them a hot meal, bring them some water, because water is the second most important thing. Um, the water was not safe for us to drink over there at all. Um, we Americans have been so used to drinking good, clean, purified water that it is hard for us to go anywhere else in the world without having some problems. And for them in Vietnam, it was a way of life to have dysentery or, you know, other kind of nasty stomach bugs and viruses, and, or not viruses, but uh, parasites and things like that. So in order to keep us healthy so we could fight, uh, they would bring in fresh water every day and we'd fill it in, the, in our canteen. Uh, at the beginning of the war, it was one canteen like this. Um, they figured out that how many of y'all have ever been to Houston in the summertime? It's hot, right? You sweat a lot, right? Do, do any of y'all play sports? Uh, what do y'all play? Soccer? What do you play? Volleyball. Volleyball and soccer. So y'all play out, do you play volleyball outside too with soccer? Or sometimes? You sweat a lot, right? And if you don't drink water, what happens? You get dehydrated, you get sick, you get very, very sick, and you can't play. Well, you want to keep soldiers healthy, so you bring in water and you make them drink a lot. Two canteens, that's a one-quart canteen there, so two of those would be half a gallon of water. Um, I have learned that it's better to drink as much water as you can possibly handle, and so I personally drink more than a gallon a day. And um, in Vietnam, they might have drank uh, two, three gallons a day just to stay hydrated enough to where the heat melt everything didn't. So stay on a rucksack like this. I've got three canteens jumbled in here wherever I can put them. That would be in addition to what soldiers carried on it. Um, 
last shelter. Shelter. Well, shelter can be, you know, you think about going camping, what's a good shelter? A tent, right? Or say, say you like really nice camping, which is in a cabin somewhere. Um, <clears throat> that's the only part of your shelter. Your shelter protects you from the elements, um, protects you from the heat, the cold, um, protects you from the rain, the sun, things like that. So my uniform would be considered shelter, uh, shelter I can walk around with. My boots would be the same, uh, trousers, hat, depending on what kind of hat I had. Um, that would pretty much uh, help me with shelter. There were also things um, that could bite you and sting you and cause you great discomfort and pain. Um, things like mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, you get bitten by here, you get a bite, a whelp, a little bit, you may get a couple more biting you before you were going to put on um, insect repellent or something like that, and then you go about your day. Over there, most of the mosquitoes carry diseases like malaria, and once you get malaria, you have it for life. You can always treat it, you can always kind of, kind of put it into remission at times, but um, it's, it's a pretty nasty disease. My grandfather was in North Africa in World War II, and you wouldn't think mosquitoes in the desert, but there were mosquitoes in the desert, and he got bit, and he had malaria for the rest of his life. So um, it got easier because the medicines and everything and the way to fight uh, mosquitoes got better, but um, you know, it was something he had to worry about forever. So uh, malaria can take you out of the field. It can get you sick. Um, also, uh, scorpions and centipedes and millipedes and things like that. I've seen some scary long red and black hairy looking awful scary looking centipedes running around here in Texas and of course that freaks me out. I don't like bugs. Um, scorpions, the big ones, the big black ones, they're pretty scary looking but the small ones that were just about everywhere in Vietnam, they would actually, they carried the right uh, neurotoxin in there that could kill you. Uh, if you were bitten and not gotten to treatment in enough time. So it wasn't a very pleasant environment because if you think about it from a scientific perspective, um, where there's heat and a lot of water, a lot of life likes to be there too. And it's just not always friendly to people. So we had a lot of things going into Vietnam that we had to contend with. Um, so it, it sounds like a pretty bad environment just with the animal size. Well, on the plant size, uh, they had what was called elephant grass, which may have stood, you know, 15 feet tall in some areas with razor-like blades of grass. And you could walk through with your sleeves rolled up because it was hot and get your arms all cut up. And, and um, so enough of the gross out lesson. All right, we're going to move on. So what do we do to help protect ourselves from things like that? Um, insect repellent, long sleeves, roll the sleeves down. Uh, from the sun, they came out with this cool hat called a mini hat. And it's just basically a, uh, a flat hat that has a wide brim that protects your back of your neck and stuff from the sun. It's got vents in it to let the air pass through so your head doesn't get too hot and you pass out from the heat. Um, it's lightweight. It's very thin cotton uh, fiber. So even when wet, you know, monsoon season, rainy season, whatever, it's going to uh, shed the water quickly. It's not going to hold it. And then when the sun comes back out, it's going to cook it all out of the hat. Um, I wear the latest pattern of uniform. It's got little lines in it. I don't know if y'all can see very well. Little lines go in there. This fabric is called a rip stop fabric. And what it is, is you got things like mesquite trees, not mesquite trees actually, but you got things with thorns and things and they can poke and tear your fabric. The second pattern uniform was this uniform. This is predating this one. It's very lightweight. It's a very thin cotton material. Uh, so it dries quickly and everything else, but it, um, uh, it, it doesn't have those rip resistant properties, so it will tear pretty easily. Uh, the first uniform that most of the soldiers went to Vietnam in uh, were called the sateens. And the sateens are basically an updated version of a World War II uniform. It's a heavier weight, 
uh, cotton it's almost like denim in comparison and weight so it's going to be kind of heavy also too what they found is that this has nice bright insignia on it you know the unit patch rank insignia name tape uh, u.s army tape in the woods or in the areas where it's mostly green these stand out very easily and especially wearing rank on your sleeves or for officers rank on your collar you're going to be made a target and when people start shooting at you you do not want to be the one they're shooting at so we decided to go with subdued rank which is just basically um, black and green although they did for a while keep the insignia on the shoulders uh, the 101st Airborne Division, you'll probably, if you ever heard of Band of Brothers, you play Call of Duty or something like that, you've probably heard of the 101st. They said, you know what, we've, we've had a lot of guys serve with this patch on our shoulder, we do not want it turned black and green. So they were one of the few units that kept their color, color uh, insignia on. And then the later war, um, also do, this is 1st Cavalry Division, um, and then rank on the collar. It's even smaller and it's pinned so I can take it off. So then an officer or someone like me could take our insignia off and we can be told apart from each other um, by the enemy. Um, okay. okay, protection and defense from enemy soldiers. Um, the main defense for a soldier against an enemy soldier mm -hmm. Is his weapon. Um, we went to war, we started the war with something called the M14. And it is a heavy beast of a weapon. I've got a little diagram here. stock it's about uh, this tall when it's standing on the ground um, it's rather cumbersome to carry and it's very heavy uh, this is an illustration of a marine carrying one of these a lot of soldiers the first ones to Vietnam was carrying this a magazine which is what the bullets fit in uh, went into the bottom just like that uh, I don't have ammunition in these, so I'll pass these around to let y'all see what they are. It's made out of steel. Um, that magazine holds 20 rounds of ammunition. That's 20 bullets. Um, a soldier was issued one horse rifle and a basic load of four more. So that's a hundred rounds of ammunition. If you are a rifleman that only shoots what you can see and hit what you can see, then a hundred rounds is adequate. We found out in Vietnam, unfortunately, we could not see the enemy that well. They were very well suited to the camouflage because they lived there. They knew how how to hide. They had been fighting the French for off and on during World War II, they fought the Japanese some for their independence. They fought the French uh, for their independence from the colonies there until 1954. And then they started fighting us uh, afterwards when I mean, we started heading there. So we found that we needed something that could fire a little bit more. It was easier to carry, something like that. And the M16 is the answer. Um, I do not have a picture of it to show you, but it's a black rifle. You see them nowadays. And the military still uses them today. These are what uh, two classic illustrations of who the U.S. Army was fighting or who the American forces were fighting. Uh, this would be a Viet Cong, basically a civilian, 
that takes up arms to fight. Uh, this would be a North Vietnamese Army fighter. You can look at their equipment. It's kind of the same. They have shelter, right? They have uniforms that work for them. They've got good footwear. Um, but unlike the Marine, who was uh, covered with helmet, body armor, web gear, big machete, rucksack on the back, all that stuff, the Vietnamese went very light. They decided, you know what, we just need a hat for them, a uniform for them, maybe a weapon, some ammunition, and they can outrun, outmaneuver us anytime, because that's the only thing they had. They didn't have all the heavy stuff that we did at the time. They didn't have tanks, they didn't have uh, aircraft, helicopters, anything like that. So why would you not want to take off your protective gear? Yeah. Yes. Exactly. It, you're like, hey, if I've got fewer people, fewer soldiers, fewer Marines over there fighting, um, I am, I'm already limited in what I can do. And so uh, for my, me to take off my gear and fight like the enemy, that means I'm probably going to get just as bad shot or killed as they, they got. So the, the emphasis was to keep your protective gear on. Um, protective gear. Helmet. Uh, first design in World War II. It comes with the removable uh, liner. It's made out of pressed uh, cotton that's got resin in it to keep it shaped. Um, it's also got the suspension system in it. Uh, steel helmet. It's about maybe a little more than a sixteenth of an inch thick. Uh, everything together weighs about three pounds. Um, the helmet was not designed to stop bullets. The helmet was designed to stop shell fragments. And so oftentimes the soldiers forewent wearing the chin strap to keep it on their head. Run, sometimes you might have to hold it onto your head or you adjusted it tightly enough that it's not gonna fall off and shake and move around. Um, Camouflage cover was one of our first attempts at camouflage. Um, it was decided that green would be better for the whole country of Vietnam rather than camouflage patterns. Because what we don't realize about Vietnam, thank you very much, is that it's not just jungle. Um, they've got highlands that kind of look like areas around here. Uh, the trees are a little bit taller though. Um, they've got uh, delta, which looks like essentially swampland and stuff. Um, you know, down around Houston or Baltimore or somewhere like that. So you had to do something that was the same for the rest. Um, and they figured this would be it. Another item that wasn't used as much but was still carried was the protective mask. The protective mask and carrier, and hopefully it'll hear my voice when I talk through this. Everybody hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Pretty much, all right. This mask is called the M17 mask. It was one of our first attempts to make a mask that uh, was light, has good vision, um, but it's really kind of hard to see and it's hard to be heard. You have to put a voice meter in it um, to uh, make it to where you can be heard. So it's got filters in here. Now, if you think about it, did the Vietnamese use chemical weapons, biological weapons, anything like that? No, we did. But in terms of weapons, we used tear gas. Say, for example, you need to get some people out of an area, you throw a tear gas grenade in. Well, you don't want to breathe that stuff too, so you carry your mask and you take it with you, and that's how you fight. The Vietnamese did not ever really employ any of that stuff, so they didn't find it necessary to uh, to carry a mask. It's something that most GIs, they would have with them maybe on a, um, an area where there are a lot of tunnels, 
of the Vietnamese built a lot of tunnels underground to escape our bombing and finding them and, and hide their weapons and stuff like that. So they uh, <coughs> they could just go down in their tunnels and around a bit a little bit and the gas didn't really follow them and they were fine. So it was very limited success with that. Um, the last thing, and it was thanks to the Marines um, that really started looking at uh, body armor. Um, something that you could wear that would be practical to wear. This weighs about 10 pounds mm -hmm. and it is, uh, this particular vest is an army vest. Um, it is made out of ballistic nylon, which you know what nylon is. You use it in shoes and clothing and bags and backpacks and things like that. Well, this is a lot of it um, and it's quarter inch, maybe three eighths of an inch thick in places. It's not hard. There's no hard plates or anything like that because all it needed to do was to stop shrapnel, to stop uh, fragments and splinters and things like that. So um, most soldiers, when they put it on, they found out, number one, hey, the breathability of my uniform now isn't there because I've got this, this heavy vest that does not breathe. And then commander said, well, you know what? Um, protective gear only works if you wear it right. So they said, all right, everybody start zipping it up. So they zip it up and everything. Well, then you're like this. And I can't move my neck very well. And then you throw my helmet on my head. And as soon as I bend my head like this, my helmet hits the back of my neck and the collar and this will drop down and get in my face. So if I was to jump down on the ground and start shooting my weapon, this would bang into the, my helmet, my helmet would go forward like this, and then I can't see anything. So later models were better, but uh, or more easier, they took that, uh, they took that into account, that issue into account, and so they came up with a better vest. All right. Now, for some hands-on, I would like two volunteers, please. You, in the green shirt, and thank you. Oh, sunny. Okay, so, um, you can stand over here, and you can stand right here. What's your name? Melissa. Melissa, and okay, yours? I'm sorry? Sunny. Sunny, Sunny. Melissa. I have a little difficulty hearing because part of my job is to have headphones in my head all day. I listen to a lot of static while I was trying to listen to Russians talk to each other. And so I have issues sometimes hearing. So um, if I ask you your name or anything or I'll look kind of like, what do you say? You might have to speak up a little bit. So thanks. All right. So, Sony, uh, you can take your shoes off. And Alyssa, right? You get to put on the You may be able to keep your shoes on. Now, I'm a big boy, which actually works out here today because I know that all of y'all can put this stuff on. Um, I'd be worried if, uh, if I couldn't have one. <laughs> yeah, you may need a belt. No, just kidding. <laughs> right, this, is, this is just demonstration purposes on all of my kids later. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Of course, this is even bigger on you. that affects you when you're out in the jungle is that your feet can get hot and sweaty. And when your feet stay wet all the time, they end up causing problems. Um, the original boots that we went to war with when she's in that uniform 
are all these high top leather boots, which are great for you know getting shiny and looking pretty and inspections and everything. But when you start walking around in these, and the fact is the heels are flat and kind of slick, um, you end up finding yourself uh, falling down a lot. The first jungle boot that they came out with were like mine with this tread pattern here, but they found that um, mine still got all in it on his and your See, it's a lot bigger so that mine can escape. Um, that was an improvement that they wore. But the fact that they had uh, cotton uppers so when they got wet they shoved the water out. They also had drain holes so that the water would shut out as soon as you cross the stream, although it also would let water in. Um, so we have a the stream. The insoles were these. And if you've ever had a good pair of running shoes, you need that support, right? You know, it's, it's got a little hump for the arch of your foot and everything to make it comfortable. This is what they walked in. And of course, it says do not boil, which I guess to disinfect them, you would throw them out or get them out or something like that. That's not a lot. I take mine out because I like my feet. Okay. Um, Alright, so they got uniforms on. When you're not wearing a proper hat and you're actually in combat, you now get your helmet. <laughs> this is required everywhere you go, whether you drive a military vehicle from point A to point B, or you, and I don't have two of so we're okay. Um, heavy, right? About three pounds? Okay. So, uh, Start with Alyssa. Combat gear. Um, I took it out. Throw it on you real quick. This is your basic. Let me get the front for you. It may hang down too far on the back. Because you're not. There we go. Okay. So if you'll hold your arms out like this, that's great. Right? Okay. Magazine pouches is where you carry your ammunition. Uh, right here I've got a compass in here. A squad leader, people in charge would have a compass. Um, if you'll turn uh, around this way. Canteen pouch, so hold your canteen and cup. This is called a bun pack. It's actually officially called a field pack because the army thought, hey, see those VC wearing just uh, clothes and a couple of you know, magazines, ammunition, or rifle, and they run around us. Let's think lighter. So that you could get your, you know, maybe one or two uh, meals in. You could get your poncho in. Let's do it here. I won't make you put this on because this is really hot. Um, I'm very heavy. As you can see, how heavy it is. This probably weighs about. Three pounds. And it, when it gets wet, unfortunately, it soaks up water, so it gets even heavier. <laughs> they came out with a better poncho later, but it's still limiting. Then on this side, over here, she's got her pouch for her entrenching tool because when you get walking through the woods for a long day and you've gotten your uh, gotten to where you're going to sleep for the night. Um, what do you do? You dig in. You dig in your foxhole, your fighting position, you build bunkers because you protect yourself because you don't want to get hit at night. Um, so they would have them carry this on uh, this side to counteract the weight of the canteen. So I'm her other side. I will give a canteen. Now, does anybody know how much water weighs? Yeah. How much? A lot. So one gallon of water weighs eight pounds. So if this is one quart, that means this weighs how much? Two pounds. With the steel, same with steel cup. I'm just not going to button it. We just added a little over uh, three pounds. I mean, we just added a couple pounds here already. Entrenching tool, the old ones. And this company, Ames, has been making entrenching tools and other tools for the military 
city of Yemen back to just after the Revolutionary War. They're still in business today. Um, this one here is from 1945. There was a lot of stuff left over from, 1940, from World War II, so that's why she has this one. This weighs maybe two and a half pounds. Now another thing that she could carry too, but we don't have it, is a bayonet. A bayonet goes on the end of your rifle, and that would clip on right here. So that would be a little bit more. Oh, also, I forgot, this is the first day packet. This is actually your battle dressing if you have to use it. You use the one that's on you, you don't use anybody else's. Um, it's lightweight. Then you have the magazines for a rifle. Uh, I don't have ammunition in these, so these don't weigh as much as ammunition does. So I took some shotgun shot and put it in bags. To simulate the weight of two magazines that could fit in here for the M14 rifle, uh, a magazine is roughly one pound ten ounces, so this is uh, roughly fifty ounces, or three pounds three ounces. I'll put that there. I'll put this there. In heavy, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, say for example, and these are not live. We have a big hole in the bottom. Say, for example, and I'll let you hold this. That's not lightweight, is it? Well, it's not. It's maybe, it's maybe a pound. Um, this is made out of cast iron. The real ones of this model type were made out of um, uh, cheap steel, and they had the fragmentation of the BBs inside of it filled with the explosive filler in it. Um, depending on who you were and what your mission was, you may carry up to four of these, but a lot of times you carry two. They have these neat little things on the side of the, sorry, you step on your shoe. Um, on the magazine pouch, and this strap goes around it so you don't lose it. Um, I'll give you, no, I'm not going to give you a flashlight. Yeah, so I'll give you a flashlight. Flashlight. The first ones like these were used in, in World War II. This is one from Vietnam. It has a red filter on it for signaling and seeing in the dark. Oh. Um, it's not light either because it uses D batteries. And D batteries are big batteries that weigh a lot. So, <coughs> put that on there. Um, so, you got water, you got your. I didn't put your rations in because that's okay. So, what I'd like for you to do. I don't have to hold the boots from a bathroom scale to give you an idea of how much everything weighs. Can you step on? There you go. Okay. So that that amount there. Add add ten pounds to that for the rifle, or eleven pounds for that for the rifle. I'm going to go ahead and get you comfy again. This was a lot, right? Oh, what's it? <laughs> Whoa, that was more than you. <laughs> just took off 40 pounds. Oh, yeah. Uniform, boots, I counted 10 pounds for the rifle, that gear right there. That's what she did. Imagine that doing that every day, 367 days, in a hot, muggy, 
things are scary as well when people are trying to kill you. And they honestly are trying to kill you. Sign me up, right? Yeah, let's go. Do this. No, not at all. Okay. You can see he's got a helmet. He's got a uh, rucksack or a backpack that carries a lot of stuff in it. His food, water, ammunition, uh, things to sleep in. Um, not a tent, but maybe a sleeping gear or something like that. Got a machete to cut, uh, especially in areas where there's a lot of foliage. Uh, cut stuff down. Black jacket. Black jacket is the same as body armor. It means quite a black jacket. Um, they were instrumental in getting them developed for soldiers because uh, they learned after World War II that they really didn't want to have so many people killed, especially from preventable injuries like uh, shell explosions or something like that. Um, he also has a uniform with lots of pockets like I do, um, jungle boots on, special, I'll talk about those in a minute. He carries with some older M14 rifle. The M14 rifles back then were uh, wooden stocks with steel, rather heavy. They weighed uh, roughly 11 pounds loaded. Um, so he's got that. It fires a uh, magazine in it. It holds 20 rounds of ammunition. In his ammunition pouches, he has four more magazines total for a total of how many rounds? You might do the math real quick. Yes. 100. Very good. So he has 100 rounds of ammunition to fight with. That doesn't sound like a lot, especially if any of y'all played Call of Duty or, or um, uh, Metal of Honor or something like that on the computer. Um, but the problem is, back then, the idea with, with combat and shooting is you only saw, shot at stuff you saw. Um, later on, we learned that because of the jungles of Vietnam, the thick foliage in some places, we couldn't always see the people we were shooting at. And so um, we would have to put an, uh, something that keeps the enemy uh, from attacking you as you're shooting at him constantly. He's going to keep his head down, right? I mean, if somebody was shooting at you, you keep your head down. So, a lot more ammunition could be carried by uh, the M16, which came on later, a lighter weight, so that um, they could fight a little bit better and longer, and the rifle was better suited for the jungles than this one was. When it gets uh, humid and hot, the wood would swell, it would cause problems with the accuracy, it wouldn't fire in the same place at the same time all the time. Um, it was heavy, it was long, it stands about uh, 30. I'm sorry, 42, 44 inches tall from the floor to the ground. So that's kind of thinking about walking with something that's out this far. It's, it's going to be kind of hard to not get caught up on something. Um, the M16 is just at a meter, roughly 39 inches in length. So it was a little bit easier. It also weighed less, roughly eight pounds, eight and a half pounds loaded, as opposed to 11, 11 and a half pounds of the M14. Um, Smaller bullet means you can carry more ammunition. So the basic load of a soldier would be 200 rounds of ammunition. He would have four magazines and two pouches, and he'd also have one in the rifle. So um, 20 round magazines would give you uh, 200 rounds. Um, okay, let's uh, go ahead and get off this real quick. Oh, wait. Um, let me go over to what the enemy had. Okay, you got two drawing examples of the two types of fighters that Americans encountered. Uh, Viet Cong, which was basically a civilian that took up arms, uh, a rifle or something like that, or in this case he has an RPG, a rocket propelled grenade on the shoulder, uh, to fight the Americans. And then also uh, NVA fighter, a North Vietnamese army who was actually a soldier like we would think of a soldier as being trained and, and being led by a military as opposed to, you know, uh, the VC, which were trained and led pretty much by maybe their tribal chief or someone common in the village or maybe someone in the village next to them or something like that. Um, sandals as opposed to boots. Civilian type clothes so he can shed his gear off and look like everybody else out there. Uh, rifle, you know, just a rifle, a pouch to hold maybe a couple magazines of ammunition, um, a hat to protect him from the elements, 
uh, a roll here that contains some of his food or maybe his bedding or something like that. So very light in comparison to the Marine that we just saw. The NVA is a little bit heavier. He actually has a chest rig that carries three magazines of ammunition, maybe a couple of grenades. Uh, he's got his rifle. His helmet's called a pit helmet, and it's not a ballistic helmet. It doesn't protect him from uh, any kind of uh, shrapnel or, or uh, bullets or anything like that, but it does protect him from the sun. And it's away from his head enough so air can circulate, because who plays sports here? Does anybody play football? Yeah, okay. Do you have practice in the summer? No, yeah. But, but there's like a airspace in between your head and the helmet shell, right? Yeah. And, and it helps keep you cool. That, that's, the same, that's the same idea with, uh, with clearing that airspace, because when your head gets hot, your whole body can shut down. Um, green, because green seemed to work the best for different areas of Vietnam. We always think of Vietnam as jungle. Uh, Vietnam had some wet swampy areas in the south. They had some areas called the Central Highlands, which are mountains. Some of them actually look a little bit like what's out here west of town. Um, the trees are a little bit taller, but kind of that broken um, vegetation and grass and scrub and things like that. So, but again, very lightweight and what you need to carry. Now the reason why they went lightweight all the time. So um, I'll just go over briefly my uniform here that I'm wearing. I'm wearing the last pattern of uh, jungle fatigues that they came up with. Uh, it's 100% cotton. It's very lightweight. It's a little bit heavier than t-shirt, but it's still pretty lightweight. You can see the lines in there that make it called rip stock. And what they found is that rip stock, uh, you're walking through the woods like if you ever want to in this here, and there's a mesquite tree with this long, long pointy uh, spikes on it. If you catch them on a shirt or something, not only is it going to poke you and probably make you bleed a little bit, but it's going to tear your clothes. And you can't have, you can't fight if your primary means of shelter protecting you from the wind, the rain, the sun, um, insects, things like that has no shape. Um, so they came out with this uniform, uh, slanted pockets because it was based on an earlier design lots of pockets to carry lots of stuff uh, that's all you need. 